Hi, it's Liz from G Mum's Place again, and today we're here with The Lady's Command by Stephanie Lawrence, published in 2016. It is the first of the Adventurers Quartet. Here is the synopsis. Number one New York Times best-selling author Stephanie Lawrence brings you The Adventurers Quartet, a riveting blend of Regency era, high seas adventure, intrigue and romance. Declan Frobisher chose Lady Edwina Delbraith as his wife. Skion of a bold seafaring dynasty, he's accustomed to getting his way. Edwina would be the woman who graced his arm, warmed his bed, and remained safely at home when he returned to sea. But once the knot is tied, Declan discovers Edwina is unconventional and strong-willed, and his marriage promises to be as tempestuous as the high seas. Edwina's fairy princess beauty hides a spine of steel. Born into the aristocracy, born to rule, and with Declan's ring gracing her finger, she expects to forge marriage by his side. Then, bare weeks into their honeymoon, Declan is recruited to sail on a secret mission. Edwina, naturally, declares she must accompany him. Facing unforeseen perils and unexpected enemies while battling to expose a dastardly scheme, Declan and Edwina discover that meeting the challenge of making an unconventional marriage work requires something they both possess. Bold and adventurous hearts. Join the adventurers, four couple whose passionate voyages will transport you. Start the journey here and follow the adventures, the mysteries and the romances to the cataclysmic end. And here is the first paragraph. April 1824, London. Marrying the lady of his dreams had proved surprisingly easy. Forging the marriage of his dreams, that apparently was in an entirely different challenge. Declan Fergus Frobisher stood alongside Lady Edwina Frobisher, Nee Delbraith, his new wife, and let the cacophony generated by the tonish crowd gathered in Lady Montgomery's drawing room to wash over him. The chattering was incessant, like a flock of seagulls squawking, yet such exchanges were the sole purpose of a soiree. In a many-hued kaleidoscope of fine silks and satins, of darker-hued superfines and black evening coats, the creme de la creme of the hot tom drifted and shifted from one circle to the next in a constantly rearranging tapestry. The large room was illuminated by several chandeliers. Light glinted on artfully twisted curls and pomaded locks and in the facets of, mis of myriad gems adorning the throats, earlobes and wrists of the many ladies attending. And now he must explain to his new wife why he's leaving. Going forward, he reached for her hand. If you have a moment, my dear, I have some news. She surrendered her hand. Her eyes searched his face. Whatever that she saw there sobered her. Yes, of course. She handed her bonnet, bonnet to Humphrey and allowed Declan to usher her into the library. After shutting the door behind them, he led her to the space before the fireplace. Unable to resist, he drew her to him and bent his head for a kiss. Stretching up, she met him in her usual eager fashion. She tasted of honey cakes. Before the engagement could spin out of hand, he broke the caress, then released her and waved her to the small sofa facing the hearth. She glanced at his face, then in a rustle of silk skirts, complied. He remained standing to one side of the hearth, instinctively assuming the stance of a captain addressing his crew. He was conscious of the nuance, but as the stance gave him confidence that he knew what he was doing and would accomplish the task before him, 
he pushed the question of its appropriateness from his mind. She sank onto the sofa and locked her gaze on his face. Don't keep me in suspense. What is it? He debated how to phrase his news and had decided that brevity would serve them best. I've been called on to do a short run to the capital of the West African settlements. It won't take long. I'll only be away for a few weeks. But for business reasons, the voyage has to be made immediately. None of my brothers or cousins are available. They're at sea and not due back in time or in Royd's case, unable to set sail due to other commitments. For several silent seconds, she stared up at him. Then, in a perfectly equable tone, she asked, How dangerous is this voyage likely to be? Not dangerous at all. Or, at most, minimally so. Given his orders to cut and run the instant he learned anything, he couldn't imagine he would face any real danger. He didn't want her worrying. He summoned a reassuring smile. I'll be home safe and sound before you know it. On that route, is the weather favourable at this time of year? Generally speaking, yes. I don't expect to run into any storms. Again, she stared at him as several seconds ticked by. Finally, her gaze fixed unwaveringly on his face, she stated, in that case, I should like to accompany you. His mind seized, his wits froze, blindsided, knocked entirely out of kilter, he simply stared down at her. Apparently not noticing his stunned state, she blithely rattled off. Given we've accomplished the most important goal we came to London to achieve, and as all else here is running smoothly, there is really no reason I need to remain in town over the next weeks. Her eyes warmed and her lips curved with eager enthusiasm. And I would so like to sail with you, to see the world by your side. He finally managed to find his tongue. No! She blinked. Then clouds gathered on in her sunny blue eyes and a frown drew down her brows. Why not? Is there some reason you haven't yet told me that makes it inadmissible for me to travel with you? Yes! He opened his mouth, then shut it. He couldn't tell her any details. She moved in circles that might easily include connections to the Holbrooks, Decker or Eldridge. One loose word and she might unwittingly place him and his crew in danger, a danger they would not otherwise face. He couldn't tell her about his mission and he certainly couldn't take her with him. Lord above, he'd only just recognised how incredibly precious to him she now was, how central to his future life, to his future happiness, and she wanted to accompany him on a flying visit to one of the roughest settlements in the Empire. No, or rather yes, he resisted the urge to rake his fingers through his hair. There are any number of reasons that make it impossible for you to sail with me. His tone made the declaration unequivocal. And I'm sorry, but I can't explain. It's entirely untenable for you to travel with me in this instance. Probably in any instance. He rarely travelled but for business, and his business was rarely with, without some risk. Indeed, sailing on the high seas was never devoid of risk. Ships wrecked, he might survive, but she was so small and weak, he doubted she would. Edwina's heart sank, but she told herself that this obstacle had always been lurking somewhere along their path. She had already decided that it was time to move forward, time to focus on establishing the daily ins and outs of how their marriage would work. He was her first challenge. They would have come to this at some point, there would always have been a first time for her to convince him to take her sailing with him. There was no argument, as Edwin already knew what she had to do. She stowed away on his ship and was not found until it was too late to turn back. This was a great read. Stephanie Lawrence must have an amazing sense of humour, as I find her characters are well-rounded, strong, but full of humour and great fun. Her description of the ships and uniforms of the era are exactly correct from my research. Yes, it is a period romance, but it is so much more 
It is romance, adventure, danger, sailing on the high seas and more. I gave this book five stars on Goodreads and I'm looking forward to the next one in the series. As always, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, smash the like button and say hi in the comments. Thank you very much for watching this video.